In this video, my aim is to get you to think more explicitly about structuring narrative writing for effect. The mark scheme for all GCSE and IGCSE English boards explicitly explicitly reward candidates whose overall structure is not just secure but also carefully managed for deliberate effect. What does this mean? Well, my interpretation of this is however well you write, you cannot get full marks if you simply employ a basic structure containing paragraphs of similar length which consistently move forward in time without any interesting shifts. What might these shifts be? Well, it could be a flashback. It could be a switch from narrative to description, a step back from the narrative to ponder more general philosophical ideas. But the key point is that more is needed in terms of structure than just starting at the beginning and ploughing your way dutifully to the end, with some paragraph breaks inserted when you think that the paragraph is getting a little long. This video will give you some ideas how to plan and structure your writing more effectively I'm going to include my own plan and narrative piece on a past IGCSE English language question. So, stay tuned. This is a Schofield on Shakespeare guide to achieving a nine for narrative writing with a particular focus on content and structure. Well, here's the mark scheme for content and structure from the IGCSC CIE English Language 0627 Paper 2. This consists of 40% of the marks for this question. The other 60% 60, 60 is for style and accuracy. And you can find more information and tips for this section of the mark scheme within my other video entitled IGCSE English Language Achieving a 9 A Star for Descriptive Narrative Writing. Other exam boards, such as AQA and Edexcel, have very similar criteria. In this video, I'm most interested in the second bullet point. How can we create structures that are secure overall, with the constituent parts well balanced and carefully managed for deliberate effect? Note the phrase, deliberate effect. You have thought and planned your paragraphs, your structure beforehand, to help build up momentum, help emphasise a key idea or feeling. You haven't just ploddingly started a new paragraph when you've run out of things to say in the previous one. But mark schemes invariably contain jargon that won't necessarily mean a great deal. It's easier to make sense of, ex of exam speak jargon through examples of writing which meet the criteria, or in this case, adapting them to produce a checklist which can be used for any narrative writing question. Let's start with structure. Now, this is slightly artificial, but using the three bullet points on screen will move you towards meeting the criteria for a structure with constituent paragraphs managed for deliberate effect. The first one, a dramatic short paragraph for effect, is easy to do, and rather like a dramatic short sentence for effect, shows the examiner that, at the very least, you recognise the importance of variation within your writing. The second one relates to the repetition of a phrase or idea within different sections of the narrative, thus, perhaps misleadingly, but hopefully not, creating a visual thread that binds your narrative in a stronger way than the use of mere paragraphs. Finally, the third one suggests experimenting a little bit with time. One flashback provided that it is clear it is a flashback and doesn't confuse the reader, will inevitably produce a more sophisticated overall structure. These content tips will help ensure your writing is more likely to be complex, engaging and realistic. The first three will remind you to use imagery within your narrative, more obviously important perhaps for a wholly descriptive piece, but still vital in terms of setting the scene. 
we are far more likely to be interested in your story if we can imagine vividly where it is taking place and hear and experience the same sounds and emotions as the character. Have a listen to a terrific extract taken from Oscar Wilde's novel The Picture of Dorian Gray. To set the scene, incredibly good-looking Dorian has killed an artist and is waiting to find out whether a former friend, Mr Campbell, is at home and will come to help him dispose of the body. This extract contains some excellent imagery. See if you can identify any similes, metaphors or personification used and think about why they are effective. The suspense became unbearable. Time seemed to him to be crawling with feet of lead while he by monstrous winds was being swept towards the jagged edge of some blacked clef, cleft of precipice. He knew what was waiting for him there, saw it indeed, and shuddering, crushed with dank hands his burning lids as though he would have robbed the very brain of sight and driven the eyeballs back into their cave. It was useless. The brain had its own food on which it battened, and the imagination, made grotesque by terror, twisted and distorted as a living thing by pain, danced like some foul puppet on a stand and grinned through moving masks. Then, suddenly, time stopped for him. Yes, that blind, slow-breathing thing crawled no more, and horrible thoughts, time being dead, raced nimbly on in front and dragged a hideous future from its grave and showed it to him. He stared at it. Its very horror made him stone. Wilde consistently personifies time. In the first example, he emphasises just how slowly it is ticking for Dorian, increasing suspense as he waits to find out whether his former friend will help him dispose of that body. In the second example, he witheringly refers to time as a thing which actually grinds to a halt. I love this simile. The imagination is personified to dance like some foul puppet on a stand and to grin through moving masks. The overall impression is that Dorian's imagination is moving frantically, demonically and jerkily out of his control. In short, he may be growing mad. The next four tips relate more pertinently to narrative writing. The idea of subtlety is important. Don't always tell us directly about a significant event that has happened. Let us work it out for ourselves. As readers, we like to think. Don't be afraid to conclude your narrative with an understated ending as well. Roald Dahl is the master of this in his short stories, which I would thoroughly recommend, by the way. Take the ending to his famous story, The Landlady. What actually happens is far from subtle or indeed perhaps realistic. A strange lady kills young men and preserves their bodies. However, Dahl never directly tells us this and we have to figure it out through a series of clues, including seemingly immobile animals, references to guests and names which ring vague alarm bells. At the end of the story, the implication is that the story's hero, Billy Weaver, has just been poisoned and is shortly to have his own dead body stuffed. But Dahl suggests this rather than tells us. Billy notices that, for instance, the tea tasted faintly of bitter almonds, which is strongly associated with cyanide. And look at how he ends the story. Temple, Billy said. Gregory Temple. Excuse my asking, but haven't there been any other guests here except them in the last two or three years? Holding her teacup high in one hand, inclining her head slightly to the left, she looked up at him out of the corners of her eyes and gave him another gentle little smile. No, my dear, she said, only you. The implication behind the only you is terrifying. Reading behind the lines, the only people who come to this hotel are young men who end up getting killed. But Dahl makes us work this out for ourselves, and as such, the writing is far more understated, sinister and effective. It isn't easy to produce subtle writing and to show rather than tell. So let's look at another example, this time from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It is chapter 5, and Victor is beholding the accomplishment of his toils. He realises very quickly that the monster is disgustingly ugly. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? 
or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful? Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes, that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shrivelled complexion and straight black lips. But notice that Shelley doesn't state that the monster is ugly. She shows us. The monster has yellow skin stretched over disgustingly visible muscles and arteries. There is a horrible contrast between healthy-looking hair and dun white eye sockets. This detailed description, strongly suggesting disgusting ugliness, is far more effective than writing which tells us outright that this creature is ugly. There should be some momentum within your narrative. It needs to go somewhere. Within one of my own recent classes, we looked at how Arthur Conan Doyle built up to a climax within his famous novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Let me set the scene. Famous detective Sherlock Holmes, with faithful sidekick Watson, are involved in a mysterious case. It seems as though the Baskerville clown are cursed due to their association with a phantom hound. Watson has been sent to protect the most recent Baskerville Sir Henry, but has left him alone for a while to meet with Sherlock. Whilst chatting on the moor, they hear a terrible sound. A low moan had fallen upon our ears. There it was again, upon our left. On that side, a ridge of rocks ended in a sheer cliff which overlooked a str stone-strewn slope. On its jagged face was spread-eagled some dark, irregular object. As we ran towards it, the vague outline hardened into a definite shape. It was a prostrate man face downward upon the ground, the head doubled under him at a horrible angle, the shoulders rounded and the body hunched together as if in the act of throwing a somersault. So grotesque was the attitude that I could not for the instant realise that that moan had been the passing of his soul. Not a whisper, not a rustle rose now from the dark figure over which we stooped. Holmes laid his hand upon him and held it up again with an exclamation of horror. The gleam of the match which he struck shone upon his clotted fingers and upon the ghastly pool which widened slowly from the crushed skull of the victim, and it shone upon something else which turned our hearts sick and faint within us, the body of Sir Henry Baskerville. The entire paragraph builds up to a key discovery, that of a dead body. But does it tell us this at the beginning of the paragraph? Hell no! First, we have the sound of pain, the low moan. Then we have a description of dangerous scenery. Then we are told that there is someone on the ground, a dark, irregular object, which presumably could be a human, but perhaps could also be an animal. Next up, it is revealed that it is indeed a human being horribly disfigured by a fall, but who we are still not told. Next up, the writer emphasises that the man is dead, still without telling us who it is. Next, Doyle tells us Holmes' reaction to finding out who is dead. He emits an exclamation of horror. And it is only within the final few words of the final sentence of this paragraph that the reader finds out that the dead person is Sir Henry Baskerville, although readers of the novel will recall that actually this is an, an erroneous identification. This is a very good example of withholding information until the last minute to help build up tension and excitement. And the final two tips are that please avoid guns, prison, drug raids, etc. You may think that they result in interesting writing, but the reverse is invariably true. Write based closely on your own experience. It will invariably be more effective. Also aim to give us insight into one of your characters, what kind of person is he or she? What makes him or her distinctive or interesting? In November 2016, Cambridge International Examining Board set this title for one of their IGCSE English language papers. Write a story that begins, she watched them leave and realised she could be there for a long time. 
Briefly, I had a go at writing my own plan for this. A key aim for me was to produce an interesting structure which did more than plod chronologically forward. Let me explain my thinking. In my first paragraph, I decided to use the question prompt as a stand-alone paragraph. I liked the idea of a very short paragraph for effect, and I decided that I didn't want to explain what had happened to the woman straight away. So why not end the paragraph after this single sentence before moving back in time in order to lead back up to that moment of people leaving her alone? In the second paragraph, I decide I will set the scene. I will make no mention whatsoever of the she from paragraph one and instead generically describe a pub and its atmosphere. I plan to use plenty of adjectives. The revellers will be beer swilling. The tables will be sticky. I also think that perhaps I will use metaphors of suits and briefcases to refer somewhat dismissively, one dimensionally, to the office drinkers. I want to make the reader wait to find out about the she from paragraph one. Following my description of a pub interior and drinkers, I decide to have some unexplained speech. Of course, we need to be careful when planning that we're not too clever, that we don't shift about too much, leaving the reader with little idea about what is actually happening. But my thinking here is to introduce a degree of tension through speech, which I will partially explain later. In paragraph four, I return to the pub. But this time the plan is to zoom in on a group of male drinkers. You're stereotypically obnoxious bankers, perhaps. I want to illustrate the fact that there are far more men than women. Indeed, in one particular group, there is just one woman who could well feel a little like an outsider. In paragraph five, I zoom in further to describe this woman. Perhaps something will happen to her. I haven't decided yet. Perhaps one of the bankers will make an obnoxious comment, maybe even without realising just how obnoxious it is. I plan to emphasise her otherness, the fact that however hard she tries, as a woman she will always remain an outsider within this group and within this culture. Perhaps personifying loneliness will help emphasise this, although looking back I think my idea of loneliness gnawing her bones is it doesn't work, it's too over the top and cheesy. In paragraph six, I'm thinking about returning to more speech. Speech which isn't entirely explained, but illustrates the gulf between the group of men and the single woman. Which just leaves the final paragraph in which I plan to repeat the first paragraph, perhaps with the wording slightly changed. The aim is to leave the reader empathizing with the woman who has just been left behind in the pub. The phrase, she could be there for a long time, is not intended to be strictly literal, but to refer to how, as a woman, she's likely to be in this position of an outsider for a long time. Now, I don't think this plan is perfect by a long stretch, but in the exam, you don't have a great deal of time to make the perfect plan. I think the key principle is to have a reasonable understanding of where you're going to go with your narrative, where you're going to end up, and how you're going to engage your reader, both by paragraphing for effects and the use of such devices listed above. In a bit, I'm going to share with you the narrative I produced and discuss how it meets the criteria within the mark scheme. But for this video to be genuinely useful, you need to do some of your own writing in the light of the advice and tips given. So press pause, spend five to 10 minutes producing your own plan, and then another 50 minutes writing your own narrative, which begins with the admittedly rather stale sounding first line, she watched them leave and realised she could be there for a long time. How did you get on? Have you produced a piece of writing which has an interesting structure to something differently to how you would write normally? Have you got some powerful descriptive devices, perhaps inspired by Mr. Wilde? Have you at some point built up towards a climax, inspired by Arthur Conan Doyle? And have you been showing rather than telling, taking inspiration from none other than Mary Shelley and Roald Dahl? Of course. Now let's read through my own response. She watched them leave and realised that she could be there for a long time. 
if a cheeky little badger had entered the red line in St Paul's on this typical Thursday evening, he would have spied a forest of trouser legs interspersed with the occasional black nylon. A taller animal, a deer, tufty-headed goat, say, would have observed gleaming red faces, hot with drink, shining eyes and pink tongues vibrating like mating bumblebees. No muzak, alas, for the loyal patrons of the Red Lion, so regulars contented themselves with their own half-shouted exchanges about prospective deals, looming legislation and <clears throat> attractive colleagues. I don't think you quite understand me. Our adorable badger might now ascertain a little more movement within the lower branches of the forest. Has a gentle breeze entered the red line, resulting in some swaying to and fro? Our taller goat, meanwhile, might care to draw attention to swifter, more rapid movements from hand to moist lips. For of course, dear reader, much beer is being consumed. And why indeed not? Whether it is good for them, whether it is refreshing the parts that others can't reach, or whether it is reassuringly expensive, after a hard day in the office, we deserve our liquid refreshment. Lots of it! Amongst the jungle, a large wine glass totters amongst the pints. It is her first week at the bank. It has gone well. She has resurrected old business contacts to potentially recruit a new client for the investment banking wing of the firm and has brought a much-needed fresh creativity to her team. Her knowledge of pending legislation is second to none. Shall we, dear reader, eavesdrop? No, let us hold on. For our badger has discerned a gentle movement from gleaming black shoe onto stiletto, a playful prod. Higher up, our goat spies a probing hand, a hungry, eager, fuel-driven, clutching hand, caressing the behind of the large wine glass. Sharp intake of breath, dear readers. A stinging motion. Silence. The badger and goat move to one side to allow the black forest of trouser legs past. Meanwhile, a biting sense of solitude, of otherness, sweeps into the red line from the entrance and twists its way around bar stalls and 15 quid pie laden tables into the soul of Merrill Lynch's new corporate fund manager, London. As she watched them leave, she realised that she could be there for a long time. So how does this response meet the band six criteria within the mark scheme? Relating particularly here to content and structure. Let's break it down. Well, firstly, we're looking for complex, engaging and realistic content. This is shown in a number of ways, including the sustained use of imagery to refer to people. In the example on screen, the group of people are described collectively as a jungle. The boorish men are pints and the solitary woman is a large wine glass. The metaphor of the jungle emphasises the idea that somehow this group are not as civilised as they might believe themselves to be. And by extension, that the women may not necessarily be safe from uncivilised predatory behaviour. Indeed, the use of the word jungle foreshadows the grope of the woman's bottom, which takes place later in the same paragraph. The story aims to be engaging in a number of ways, and one of those is its use of the theoretical badger and goat characters, referred affectionately within the examples now on screen. These animals give different perspectives on the humans, with the badger observing the lower parts of the humans' bodies, including the clumsy nudge of the woman's stiletto by a man's black shoe, and the goat, the upper parts, including the increasingly hot, drunken faces and the grope. Although the theoretical and imaginary scenario of a goat and badger observing drinkers in a pub is clearly not realistic, the description of the pub and the behaviour of those within it is. I include some job-specific terminology, including legislation, fund manager and investment banking wing, to give readers more detailed insight into the lives of the characters, and in particular, the competence of the woman. I want to emphasise that she is good at her job, thus making the sexual assault and subsequent isolation all the more shocking and unacceptable. The response needs to be cohesive. Cohesive can be defined as united and working together effectively. What makes this narrative cohesive? Well, a number of factors. Firstly, we have the common thread of the badger and goat running throughout. 
They feature in paragraphs 2, 4, 5 and 6 and are silent witnesses to the woman's developing discomfort. However, I also repeat imagery which helps bind the narrative together. A forest of trouser legs interspersed with the occasional black nylon in paragraph 2 becomes simply a black forest of trouser legs in paragraph 6. The overall structure is secure. Within the seven paragraphs, each has a different sharp focus, whether it be describing the drinker's clothing and drink fueled intoxication within a pub in paragraph 2, or the despondent feelings of the woman in paragraph 6. The constituent parts need to be well balanced and carefully managed for a deliberate effect. Note how paragraphs 2 and 4, describing increasing drunkenness, build up to the sexual assault in paragraph 5. Note also how paragraph 3 is deliberately far removed from the pub to unsettle and foreshadow the darker mood of the final two paragraphs. Good narrative writing needs to have elements of fiction including description. Note the close description of the drinker's faces, eyes and tongues. I use a simile to suggest how rapidly the men are speaking. Their pink tongues are vibrating like mating bumblebees, although the use of the word vibrating has potential sexual undertones, thus foreshadowing the seedy act at the end of paragraph 5. There is not a great deal of individual characterisation of the men, and this is deliberate. I want them to be seen as a ruthless, misogynistic collective. However, some insight into the woman's character is given. We know that it is her first week at the bank, that she is fresh and creative, intelligent, good at her job, that she's probably good with people, as witnessed in her rapid resurrection of old business contacts, that she is feeling slightly tipsy, and that in paragraph 6 she is left devastated and isolated by the actions of one of her colleagues. Paragraph 5 starts building up to a climax through the direct invitation to the reader to eavesdrop, which is promptly withdrawn. The phrase, let us hold on, implies that something exciting may be about to happen, something worth waiting for. The momentum continues with firstly the description of a shoe nudging a stiletto, and then the introduction of a probing hand. Note that you need to wait until the second half of the sentence to find out exactly what the hand is probing. The clarifying, hyperbolic use of adjectives, hungry, eager, fuel-driven, clutching, delays this revelation further, thus increasing tension. However, the metaphor of the large wine glass from the beginning of the paragraph is extended, another example of the cohesion within the narrative, so that the reader has to deduce that the woman has been groped. The paragraph then switches to dramatic short sentences for effect, including one implying that the woman has slapped the groper. The switch to short sentences is dramatic and further increases the sense of tension. And moving from building up towards a climax to using cogent detail. Cogent means clear, logical and convincing detail. I wonder whether this manifests itself in the personification of the biting sense of solitude, which twists its way through different parts of the pub, bar stalls and tables, into the soul of the woman. Note also the hyphenation within 15 quid pie laden tables. This cogent table emphasises the prosperity of those attending the pub and somehow increases the shame that such a depraved act could take place amongst such wealthy clientele. So to sum up, candidates achieving a 9 for narrative writing are likely to look closely at the CIE English Language IGCC Mark Scheme for Narrative Writing or the Mark Scheme of their exam board and may use a checklist to help remind them of useful techniques and principles. Whilst I'm not a massive fan of being too prescriptive, the majority of Grade 9 candidates are likely to recognise the value of using an original, unusual simile personification, a metaphor, being subtle, showing, not telling, building up to a climax, being realistic, giving some insight into, into character, using a dramatic short paragraph for effect, repeating a motif at different times in a narrative for effect, and ensuring that at least one paragraph moves backwards in time. Candidates achieving a nine will plan 
and experiment with structure, as I did for my own narrative, which began with she watched them leave and realised that she could be there for a long time. I hope this video has given you some food for thought, some inspiration and plenty of practical suggestions. Many thanks for watching.